Hello, brothers and sisters. I plug in my tablet here. It's this tablet that allows me to see what your comments are. Let's see here. No, I need to. One second. So I'd love to know who's joining me for this. So feel free to check in on uh, in, the, in the comment section, the comment thread, whether you're on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. If not, if you're watching on our parish 
live stream page, that's fine. You're not missing out on anything. But if you're using one of those other platforms, love to hear from you. We're going to continue our reflection on the prayer life, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. And our icon right now is the upper room. Before we start, let's begin with prayer. Let us pray. O oh, Heavenly Father, in whom we live and move and have our being, we humbly pray thee so to guide and govern us by thy Holy Ghost, that in all the cares and occupations of our life we may not forget thee, but may remember that we are ever walking in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. That prayer is so fitting for our reflections right now in our catechesis time. Asking to be guided and governed by the Holy Spirit. That's what we mean by receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. That in receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, part of his gift is to guide and govern us. And a gift of the Holy Spirit is that throughout our lives, the cares and occupations of our life, that we may not forget the Father, that we may not forget Thee, because this, uh, this prayer is addressed to the Father. That by the Holy Spirit, we ask, in our, despite the cares and occupations of our life, we may not forget You, the Father, but may remember that we are ever walking in Thy sight. In other words, that we may be always aware of the I amness of God through Jesus Christ. When we are aware of the I amness of God in our everyday lives, we are truly receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. We are, as a matter of habit, Remembering that wherever we go, we are walking in God's sight and that his presence is with us thereby. That we can recognize the divine wherever we are, the divine presence anywhere in the world, anywhere in our lives. As a matter of habit, not as a matter of chance or as a matter of accident, but as a, a matter of habit that we are remembering the Father by being guided and governed by the Holy Spirit into the presence and I amness of Jesus Christ as he was present in his I amness in the upper room. To the 120 Christians, disciples of Jesus, many of whom are calendar saints, that is to say canonical saints, official saints in that room, a veritable all-star cast of the stars of our church. Christ to them in the upper room, having been sent there by him upon his ascension to wait for the promise of the Father, because Christ is going to send the Holy Spirit, ask the Father to send the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father, beckoned, it seems, by the Son. Go there to receive the upper, to go to the upper room to receive the gift of the Father which is the Holy Spirit, whose job, whose ministry, whose activity is to make us aware of Jesus Christ and his presence. That the 120 members of the Upper Room Parish Church would know that they are in the sight of Jesus Christ, 
glorious and resurrected. With them, revealed to them in the breaking of the bread and the opening of the scriptures. Revealed to them also by the woundedness of Christ as he showed his wounds to Thomas. Revealed to them as he called them by their name, as he called Mary Magdalene by her name. Revealed to them as they recognized the abundance of grace that they had and had received, just as Jesus turned an empty night of fishing into a catch of 153 whoppers. And also, as Jesus was revealed, as they felt and took on the responsibility to witness Christ in the world, as Jesus had told Peter, feed my sheep, the 120 parishioners in the upper room knew that it was their responsibility to proclaim the gospel, to feed the sheep. As Peter led the way, Peter, along with the other 12, including Matthias, who was elected during the time in the upper room. It's an impossible, mind-blowing meditation to make. Of the 120 people in the upper room, Recognizing Christ's I am-ness, recognizing his presence in so many different ways and how it was a leading and guiding presence. Again, this is the Holy Spirit leading and guiding the church. The Holy Spirit does not only, as if that's not enough, does not only guide us into Christ present as the scriptures are opened and the bread is broken. But the Holy Spirit guides us into the truth of Christ's presence in each one of us and to in each other. And so the 120 members of the, of the upper room church palpably saw as they looked in the faces of each other, the face of Christ. I think particularly Mary, as she was in the upper room, becoming naturally the mother of the church, being the mother of God. She'd be the mother of the church. Because Mary was just told by Jesus at the foot of the cross to behold John, the beloved disciple, whose head had rested on her son's breast and who had run to the empty tomb after being beckoned by Mary Magdalene and other holy women, and we are told believed, and also knew it was Christ as he and Peter and others were on the boat, seeing a stranger on the shore, calling to them, telling them to let their net down on the other side of the boat. John, the beloved disciple, is the one who says to Peter, it is the Lord, recognizing something of the abundance about to come. Maybe it was the way that the man on the beach gestured, or maybe it was something of his voice that, were, that instantly struck the beloved disciple. So Mary, at the foot of the cross with the beloved disciple, received instruction from her son. Behold, she, he said to her, behold, your son. Meaning, as, he, as she looked upon John, she looked upon Jesus. 
that John was now her son, as Jesus was her son, and thereby all disciples who, through our prayer life, the threefold regular of office, mass, and our personal devotion, our life in fellowship, the more we embrace that, the more we imitate John. laying our heads on the heart, the breast of Jesus, as he is revealed to us intimately. And as we imitate John, then others, especially Mary, see in us a transformation. The more we imitate John, the more people see us and see Christ in us. Not that it's anything we boast about. It's nothing that we've done on our own except yearn for God and yearn for Jesus' presence in our lives. Through that yearning, God's grace transforms us that others recognize Christ in us. Behold your son. That people behold in us the peace of Christ, the love of Christ, the compassion of Christ. As we interact with people in the world, they may not name it that way, but they're feeling it, and they know what it feels like to be loved. They know what it feels like for another person to have compassion upon them. They know what it feels like to be around a person of genuine, authentic peace. It was opening up into this transformation that the 120 disciples were enraptured by were made them full of joy made them full of grace like Mary made them at peace and in God's rest a rest and peace that they had never known before because Christ was never present to them in his I amness like this before. Never even when they walked with him through the Holy Land, as he preached and as he teached, as he healed, as he listened, as he dined with people. Never before did they experience his presence until this upper room after the ascension, before Pentecost, Christ was somehow more present than he ever had been. It's because he was present through the scriptures in ways that they had never seen before because they have scriptures prior to his ascension, prior to his entering into his glory on the cross, were veiled. They had read them before. They had heard rabbis preach about them before. Never before did they understand them now. And so his intimacy was deep. Through the scriptures and also as the community broke bread, imitating what Jesus taught the 12. About five and a half weeks prior in the upper room when he instituted the Eucharist and washed the feet of the 12, instituting the priesthood and instituting the Eucharist. The commandment was take, eat, take, drink, do this for the remembrance of me, do this for the actually making present again of me, his I amness. Do this for the I amness of me, is the Eucharist. And so, 
together intimately in the beauty of holiness. Christ's presence was so alive and real and intimate and personal within the community of the Upper Room Church. It was a feeling of ecstasy and also profound calm. Let's turn to Acts chapter 1 and continue our reflections. Acts chapter 1, a lot happens. A lot. We've done nothing really in these weeks of catechetical meditations, or the term for which is mystagogy, that's to say, being led into the mystery. We've done nothing really except meditate on Acts chapter 1 and 2, supported by a part of Luke and a part of John. In verse 15 of chapter 1 of Acts, with the, the setting of these 120 people, the 11 disciples, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the other holy women. In those days, Peter stood up among the brethren, the company of persons was in all about 120, and said, Brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who was to guide those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry, the ministry of the twelve, which goes back to the twelve sons of Israel. Along with twelve tribes of twelve tribes of Israel. Peter continued. Now this man bought a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their language a kaldama, that is, field of blood. I'm not sure if this is Peter instructing the 120 with new information or if this is Peter reviewing what everybody already knew my guess is that it's the latter but Peter continues and here's the really interesting part for it is written in the book of Psalms but why would they be looking at the book of Psalms Let his habitation become desolate, and let there be no one to live in it. And let his office another take. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from his baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, which was anywhere from one to eight days prior to Peter's speaking at this moment. One of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. That's the requirement of being a bishop, an apostle, a witness to the resurrection. So our, our bishop, servant of God, Daniel, his primary ministry, amidst all the things that we'd love our bishop to do, his primary ministry is to be a witness to the resurrection. Luke continues, because that concludes Peter's speaking. And they put forward two, let's say two candidates. Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justus, and Matthias. So notice the criteria of being even considered to be a bishop. For Matthias or Barsabbas, Joseph, Justus, I'm not sure which, we'll just call him Joseph. The criteria was that they had 
been present in Jesus's public ministry. That is to say, from the baptism of John, which began his public ministry, to the ascension, with, which ended his public ministry. All of that is captured in the four Gospels, the, the, the accounts of the four evangelists, including St. Mark, whose feast is today. They recount the sojournings of Jesus, his public ministry, the gospel, the good news. And so the criterion of being a bishop is to be a witness to the resurrection according to the gospels, the, the, the evangelist's account. I wonder if the criteria we use in the church today to select new bishops is both this onerous and yet this simply stated. Verse 24, and they prayed. This is how they made a decision, was through prayer, or began in prayer. They prayed and they said, Lord, you know the hearts of all men. Show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas has turned aside to go to his own place. So they asked for the Holy Spirit to guide them. They asked for the Holy Spirit to guide them. And that's in, in reinforced by the final verse of chapter 1. And they cast lots for them. A lot fell on Matthias, and he was enrolled with the 11 apostles and became the 12th. How could they leave this up to chance, we might ask ourselves? Something equivalent to the roll of a dice. How could they allow something so important to be decided by such chance, we might be wondering. And I think it's the right way to think. We should be somewhat taken aback. There's no account here of debates. There's no account here of factions developing, like a straw poll, the Iowa caucuses. There's no account of votes being bought either, like in Chicago. Did I say that out loud? Not just Chicago. They prayed, and they asked God, who they acknowledged, knew the hearts of all men to show them whom he chooses, who God chooses. And so they cast lots. With, so why did they do that? It's because of their trust in God's providence. They're because of their trust in the guiding hands of God. That is to say, their trust in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had gotten them into that room in the first place. The Holy Spirit had gotten them to follow Jesus. The Holy Spirit had started to teach them about Christ's I amness, his presence in that room through the breaking of scriptures and the breaking and the breaking of bread, the opening of scriptures and the breaking of bread. How he was present in them, in their hearts, in their bodies. How in some sense, according to Mary and John at the foot of the cross, they had become Jesus or begun the process of being transformed. But that it had begun. The Holy Spirit was guiding them and protecting them as they were meeting amidst Roman oppression that could dis potentially destroy them at any moment. It just after all, the Romans, in cohorts with the high priests of the temple and the leadership of the temple, had just assassinated or murdered Jesus. If Jesus could be killed, so could they. They felt protected because Luke tells us they felt joyous in all of this. 
They were joyously in the upper room, praying together in one accord. They trusted the Holy Spirit so much that they knew his presence would make these casting of lots not a game of chance, but rather an opportunity to trust God, to know God would reveal himself in this, which he did, because Matthias was picked, and Matthias went on to plant churches and proclaim the gospel, witness to the resurrection according to the public ministry of Christ, the requirements of being an apostle, of being a bishop. Notice, brothers and sisters, which I said a little bit earlier, that Peter was quoting from the Psalms. Let his habit, in verse 20, let his habitation become desolate and let there be no one to live in it. That's Psalm 69. And let his office another take. That's Psalm 109. Why would Peter be quoting from the Psalms? Well, this fits in the mosaic that we've been assembling because Jesus had taught them how to find him, how to find the Holy Spirit, how to find guidance, which is Christ. In the Psalms was what Jesus taught the disciples in the upper room on Easter Sunday evening to do having already taught the two disciples on the way to Emmaus how to do so with the books of Moses and the prophets. So now they recognized that this verse, which they had before not associated with something that would lead them and guide them, all of a sudden became a light in an otherwise unlit path. This is what we should do. But why were they looking at the Psalms in the first place? I think this is enough evidence, or at least it's strongly suggestive, that they were doing what obedient Jews did even then. What religious Jews did was pray through the Psalter, like we pray through the Psalter. Now, whether it was through what we call matins and even song, morning prayer and evening prayer. We don't really know for sure. There's some suggestive evidence that religious Jews were expected to pray three times a day. And their, the, the stuff of their prayer was psalms and hymns within the Jewish pattern and within the Jewish religion of nearly 2,000 years ago. That's what the evidence seems to suggest, but not conclusively show I hope you see the significance of me underscoring this because and the significance is this as we pray through the psalms morning and evening matins and even song over 30 days praying one, all 150 of the psalms the more we do it the more we will hear Christ in them, the more the Holy Spirit will guide us through the verses of the Psalms, through the images that are in the verses, through the words. We can be guided in our lives. And I want to really emphasize this. The Psalms for receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is a guiding gift. That's why we pray through the Psalms in morning prayer and evening prayer, to, be, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit as Peter taught on Pentecost, which is a gift that guides us in our life, guides us and comforts us with the presence of God, because when we sense God speaking to us in the Psalms, we are comforted by his presence. Maybe we're also surprised by his presence. Maybe we're also 
unsettled by his presence. These are all normal scriptural reactions to the presence of God. Even being a little fearful, but the angels always say, don't be afraid. But after the fear turns into holy fear, that is to say, fright turns into awe and reverence. Know that God is present when you sense him speaking through the scriptures and through the Psalms specifically. There's a reason the Psalms are so important in the Christian life from the very beginning. Because they provide an opportunity to experience the I amness of God through the guiding, the guidance of the Holy Spirit through uncertain times. What shall we do next? The church was asking herself in the upper room. What shall I do next? Mary was asking herself as Gabriel announced to her. We can only know when we abandon ourselves to divine providence. Surrender ourselves, give ourselves over, which is what we do when we genuinely pray the Psalms, as well as the other prayers and canticles of our daily offices. We'll stop there for now because I have to attend to a question that I received. But I, let me know if this is making sense, brothers and sisters. Sorry, the, the, let me know if this is making sense. Okay? It's important to, to me to hear from you whether this, whether our reflections in the upper room, our reflections on the spiritual life, threefold regular, whether these reflections on the gift, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit is coming across and is helping. Okay? Let me know, please. In the time we have remaining, I was asked a question, and I want to make sure I get the question exactly, so I'm going to read it. Just give me a second here. This will give you a chance to catch your breath after that. that was, maybe that was pretty intense. The question I received was, does our Anglican tradition hold the same definition of God as all other Christian traditions and denominations? Does our Anglican tradition hold the same definition of God as other Christian denominations and traditions? So the answer in the most concise way possible is yes. There's nothing, you, there's nothing unique about the Anglican doctrine of God, which is to say that, that there's no unique Anglican definition of God. Famously, an, uh, an Archbishop of Canterbury in the 20th century, in the 1950s, Geoffrey Fisher, pronounced something important, which is both true and an aspiration. That is to say, both presently true of the of Anglican tradition, including now, but also something for us always to aspire to as Anglicans, which is that Anglicans have, he said, no doctrine of our own. We only have that which is in the creeds and the positive faith held by all churches or all traditions, the Catholic Church, East and West through time everywhere and in all places. He said that we have no unique doctrine of our own. Our doctrine is simply that of the undivided universal church. So that's both something that's true, and, and Anglicans taught that before Archbishop Fisher pronounced that, but Anglicans have certainly taught that afterwards, supported by him. It's always nice to have an Archbishop saying something that's true. 
But it's also something to shoot for and aspire to because we are always tempted to develop, we're always tempted to cocoon, we being very, the various traditions and denominations of the church. I really don't like that term, denominations. There's nothing wrong with asking it, but denomination just, but the reason I don't like the word denomination is because it, it, it suggests this kind of cocooning, which isn't the case and shouldn't be the case if it is. I rather use the term traditions, which you did, David, in your question. There are a variety of traditions in the church. There always have been. There have been from the very beginning. There, are, there obviously are various traditions now. Okay. Um, and so if you want to understand the ang or speak of the Anglican tradition, it's, although it, properly it's more like Anglican traditions because there are various streams, so to speak, all under the umbrella of the Anglican way, which we would identify as being rooted in the Book of Common Prayer, which would be the way to identify the umbrella of Anglican strands or traditions. Because no other traditions use the Book of Common Prayer. And, uh, so, you know, it's, this is one of our markers. But well, so yes, well, the Book of Common Prayer and the life of the liturgical and devotional life that it orders has no unique doctrine of God. And note that, that Roman Catholics or various Eastern Orthodox or Pro Protestants would disagree with. Our God, the, the, the understanding or doctrine or theology of of God, which or definition of God is the same everywhere in all places. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. And that the Holy Spirit reveals to us how the, how the Holy Spirit reveals to us how the Father speaks through Jesus. It's another way to talk about the doctrine of the Trinity. And that Jesus Christ is the unique and authoritative, definitive, and final revelation of the Father. That's the significance of Jesus saying on the cross, amongst his seven last words, it is finished. It's all revealed. The doctrine of God is also that he has made all things, that there is no thing that is made that he has not made. In fact, has not made through his through the Son, all things being made through Jesus, including Adam, by the way, and Eve. They're both made in the image of Jesus, which means Jesus was real. and predates Adam and Eve. They're made in the image of him. Can't make, can't be made in the image of something that doesn't exist yet. Or as we say, this is part of the doctrine or definition of God, there was never a time when Jesus was not. Anglicans, with all, like all other Christians, hold that. I would say that if there's going to be any kind of distinctions that Anglicans are a part of. It would be in terms of how the, the relationships between the definition of God and the theology of the sacraments interact. Let me say more about that. So I often speak of or speak that Anglicanism is one of is within the sacramental tradition of the church. Not all traditions or not all denominations are. And when we use the word Protestant, we usually we 
although it's nothing is neat and easy in the church, but as a general broad, broad brush statement, the Protestant traditions do not participate in the sacramental traditions of, in their most historic sense. Whereas Anglican, Roman Catholic, and Orthodox do. That sacraments, Eucharist principally, but also baptism, confirmation, or chrismation, this is what the Orthodox call it, matrimony, holy unction, confession, and holy orders are all sacraments and they all are salvific. They are, are, they are all material conveyors of God's grace. They're all salvific. They are all mediums, media of God. So that's why I talk about how when, when sacramental theology interacts with the doctrine of God, we see that our understanding and definition of God demands including the sacraments because the sacraments are how we receive God in according to the historic sacramental traditions of the church. Okay. So now I do have to say that there are sometimes within, I said that there's streams or strands within what we call Anglican prayer book. And there are some that emphasize our participation in the sacramental nature of the church more than other strands of Anglicanism. Okay, so this is where Anglicans like, like to fight or get in battles okay, about what true Anglicanism is. Okay, But the fact of the matter is, is that we are able as Anglicans to participate in the full sacramental life of the church with no unique doctrine of our own, following Archbishop Fisher's statement, but simply to receive the gifts of the sacraments that we have been given by Christ through the church as it has lived and breathed and moved in the lands of this earth, reaching the British lands and has the sacramental life lived in the British lands and come down to us today. It's ordered by the Book of the Common Prayer. Ordered by the Book of the Common Prayer. Ordered by the Book of Common Prayer. We have received, and we are able to receive the full sacramental reality of the church, which is to say the sacramental way that we understand participation in God. It's all tied together. So, so again, though, short answer, no, we have no unique definition of God, but rather the definition of God shared by all of the, all within the Catholic Orthodox family of Christian life. Finish with a prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, who does teach the hearts of thy faithful people by sending to them the light of thy Holy Ghost, grant us by the same Holy Ghost to have a right judgment in all things and evermore to rejoice in his holy comfort. Through the merits of Christ Jesus, our Savior, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the same Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I bid you peace.
And I'll see you in a little over an hour for the evening song.